Chapters 68 to 71. Chapter 68. The Blanket. I have given no small attention to that not unvexed subject, the skin of the whale. I have had controversies about it with experienced whalemen afloat, and learned naturalists ashore. My original opinion remains unchanged, but it is only an opinion. The question is, what and where is the skin of the whale? Already you know what his blubber is. That blubber is something of the consistence of firm, close-grained beef, but tougher, more elastic and compact, and ranges from eight or ten to twelve and fifteen inches in thickness. Now, however preposterous it may at first seem to talk of any creature's skin as being of that sort of consistence and thickness, yet in point of fact these are no arguments against such a presumption, because you cannot raise any other dense enveloping layer from the whale's body but that same blubber, and the outermost enveloping layer of any animal, if reasonably dense, what can that be but the skin? True, from the unmarred dead body of the whale, you may scrape off with your hand an infinitely thin, transparent substance, somewhat resembling the thinnest shreds of isinglass, only it is almost as flexible and soft as satin, that is, previous to being dried, when it not only contracts and thickens, but becomes rather hard and brittle. I have several such dried bits, which I use for marks in my whale-books. It is transparent, as I said before, and being laid upon the printed page, I have sometimes pleased myself with fancying it exerted a magnifying influence. At any rate, it is pleasant to read about whales through their own spectacles, as you may say. But what I am driving at here is this. The same infinitely thin isinglass substance, which, I admit, invests the entire body of the whale, is not so much to be regarded as the skin of the creature, as the skin of the skin, so to speak. For it were simply ridiculous to say that the proper skin of the tremendous whale is thinner and more tender than the skin of a newborn child. But no more of this. Assuming the blubber to be the skin of the whale, then, when this skin, as in the case of a very large sperm whale, will yield the bulk of one hundred barrels of oil, and when it is considered that, in quantity, or rather weight, that oil, in its express state, is only three-fourths, and not the entire substance of the coat, some idea may hence be had of the enormousness of that animated mass, a mere part of whose mere integument yields such a lake of liquid as that. Reckoning ten barrels to the ton, you have ten tons for the net weight of only three-quarters of the stuff of the whale's skin. In life the visible surface of the sperm whale is not the least among the many marvels he presents. Almost invariably it is all over obliquely crossed and recrossed with numberless straight marks in thick array, something like those in the finest Italian line engravings. But these marks do not seem to be impressed upon the isinglass substance above mentioned, but seem to be seen through it, as if they were engraved upon the body itself. Nor is this all. In some instances, to the quick, observant eye, those linear marks, as in a veritable engraving, but afford the ground for far other delineations. These are hieroglyphical, that is, if you call those mysterious ciphers on the walls of the pyramids hieroglyphics, then that is the proper word to use in the present connection. By my retentive memory of the hieroglyphics upon one sperm whale in particular, I was much struck with a plate representing the old Indian characters chiseled on the famous hieroglyphic palisades on the banks of the upper Mississippi. Like those mystic rocks, too, the mystic-marked whale remains undecipherable. This allusion to the Indian rocks reminds me of another thing. Besides all the other phenomena which the exterior of the sperm whale presents, he not seldom displays the back, and more especially his flanks, effaced in great part of the regular linear appearance by reason of numerous rude scratches, 
altogether of an irregular, random aspect. I should say that those New England rocks on the sea coast, which Agassi imagines to bear the marks of violent scraping contact with vast floating icebergs, I should say that those rocks must not a little resemble the sperm whale in this particular. It also seems to me that such scratches in the whale are probably made by hostile contact with other whales, for I have most remarked them in the large, full-grown bulls of the species. A word or two more concerning this matter of the skin or blubber of the whale. It has already been said that it is stripped from him in long pieces called blanket pieces. Like most sea terms, this one is very happy and significant, for the whale is indeed wrapped up in his blubber as in a real blanket or counterpane, or, still better, an Indian poncho slipped over his head and skirting his extremity. It is by reason of this cosy blanketing of his body that the whale is enabled to keep himself comfortable in all weathers, in all seas, times, and tides. What would become of a Greenland whale, say, in those shuddering icy seas of the north, if unsupplied with his cosy surtout. True, other fish are found exceedingly brisk in those hyperborean waters, but these, be it observed, are your cold-blooded, lungless fish, whose very bellies are refrigerators, creatures that warm themselves under the lee of an iceberg, as a traveller in winter would bask before an inn-fire, whereas, like man, the whale has lungs and warm blood, freeze his blood, and he dies. How wonderful it is, then, except after explanation, that this great monster, to whom corporeal warmth is as indispensable as it is to man, how wonderful that he should be found at home, immersed to his lips for life in those arctic waters, where, when seamen fall overboard, they are sometimes found months afterward, perpendicularly frozen into the hearts of fields of ice, as a fly is found glued in amber." But more surprising it is to know, as has been proved by experiment, that the blood of a polar whale is warmer than that of a Borneo negro in summer. It does seem to me that herein we see the rare virtue of a strong individual vitality, and the rare virtue of thick walls, and the rare virtue of interior spaciousness. Oh, man, admire and model thyself after the whale. Do thou, too, remain warm among ice. Do thou, too, live in this world without being of it. Be cool at the equator. Keep thy blood fluid at the pole. Like the great dome of St. Peter's, and like the great whale, retain, O man, in all seasons, a temperature of thine own. But how easy, and how hopeless, to teach these fine things! Of erections, how few are domed like St. Peter's. Of creatures, how few vast as the whale. Chapter 69 The Funeral Haul in the chains, let the carcass go astern. The vast tackles have now done their duty. The peeled white body of the beheaded whale flashes like a marble sepulchre. Though changed in hue, it has not perceptibly lost anything in bulk. It is still colossal. Slowly it floats more and more away, the water round it torn and splashed by the insatiate sharks, and the air above vexed with rapacious flights of screaming fowls, whose beaks are like so many insulting poniards in the whale. The vast, white, headless phantom floats further and further from the ship, and every rod that it so floats, what seems square roods of sharks and cubic roods of fowls augment the murderous din. For hours and hours from the almost stationary ship that hideous sight is seen, beneath the unclouded and mild azure sky, upon the fair face of the pleasant sea, wafted by the joyous breezes, that great mass of death floats on and on, till lost in infinite perspectives. There's a most doleful and most mocking funeral, the sea vultures all in pious mourning, the air sharks all punctiliously in black or speckled. In life but few of them would have helped the whale, I ween, if peradventure he had needed it. 
But upon the banquet of his funeral they most piously do pounce. O oh, horrible vulturism of earth, from which not the mightiest whale is free! Nor is this the end. Desecrated as the body is, a vengeful ghost survives and hovers over it to scare. Espied by some timid man-of-war or blundering discovery vessel from afar, when the distance obscuring the swarming fowls nevertheless still shows the white mass floating in the sun and the white spray heaving high against it, straightway the whale's unharming corpse with trembling fingers is set down in the log shoals rocks and breakers hereabouts beware and for years afterwards perhaps ships shun the place leaping over it as silly sheep leap over a vacuum because their leader originally leaped there when a stick was held there's your law of precedence there's your utility of traditions there's the story of your obstinate survival of old beliefs never bottomed on the earth and not now even hovering in the air. There's orthodoxy. Thus, while in life the great whale's body may have been a real terror to his foes, in his death his ghost becomes a powerless panic to the world. Are you a believer in ghosts, my friend? There are other ghosts than the Cock Lane one, and far deeper men than Dr. Johnson, who believe in them. CHAPTER SEVENTY THE SPHINX It should not have been omitted that previous to completely stripping the body of the Leviathan, he was beheaded. Now, the beheading of the sperm whale is a scientific anatomical feat, upon which experienced whale surgeons very much pride themselves, and not without reason. Consider that the whale has nothing that can properly be called a neck. On the contrary, where his head and body seem to join, there, in that very place, is the thickest part of him. Remember also that the surgeon must operate from above, some eight or ten feet intervening between him and his subject, and that subject almost hidden in a discoloured, rolling, and oftentimes tumultuous and bursting sea. Bear in mind, too, that under these untoward circumstances he has to cut many feet deep in the flesh, and in that subterraneous matter, without so much as getting one single peep into the ever-contracting gash thus made, he must skilfully steer clear of all adjacent interdicted parts, and exactly divide the spine at a critical point, hard by its insertion into the skull." Do you not marvel, then, at Stubb's boast that he demanded but ten minutes to behead a sperm whale? When first severed, the head is dropped astern, and held there by a cable till the body is stripped. That done, if it belong to a small whale, it is hoisted on deck to be deliberately disposed of. But with a full-grown leviathan this is impossible, for the sperm whale's head embraces nearly one-third of his entire bulk and completely to suspend such a burden as that, even by the immense tackles of a whaler, this were as vain a thing as to attempt weighing a Dutch barn in jeweler's scales. The Pequod's whale being decapitated and the body stripped, the head was hoisted against the ship's side, about halfway out of the sea, so that it might yet in great part be buoyed up by its native element. And there, with the strained craft steeply leaning over to it, by reason of the enormous downward drag from the lower masthead, and every yard-arm on that side projecting like a crane over the waves, there that blood-dripping head hung to the Pequod's waist, like the giant Holofernes from the girdle of Judith. When this last task was accomplished it was noon, and the seamen went below to their dinner. Silence reigned over the before tumultuous but now deserted deck. An intense copper calm, like a universal yellow lotus, was more and more unfolding its noiseless, measureless leaves upon the sea. A short space elapsed, and up into this noiselessness came Ahab, alone from his cabin. Taking a few turns on the quarter-deck, he paused to gaze over the side. Then, slowly getting into the main chains, he took Stubb's long spade, still remaining there after the whale's decapitation, 
and striking it into the lower part of the half-suspended mass, placed its other end crutchwise under one arm, and so stood leaning over with eyes attentively fixed on this head. It was a black and hooded head, and hanging there in the midst of so intense a calm, it seemed the sphinxes in the desert. "'Speak, thou vast and venerable head,' muttered Ahab, "'which, though ungarnished with a beard, yet here and there looks hoary with mosses. Speak, mighty head, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations. Where unrecorded names and navies rust, and untold hopes and anchors rot, where in her murderous hold this frigate earth is ballasted with bones of millions of the drowned, there in that awful waterland, there was thy most familiar home. Thou hast been where Bell or Diver never went, has slept by many a sailor's side where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down. Thou sawest the locked lovers when leaping from their flaming ship, Heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting wave, True to each other when heaven seemed false to them. Thou sawest the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck, For hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw, And his murderers still sailed on unharmed, While swift lightnings shivered the neighboring ship That would have borne a righteous husband to outstretched longing arms. O oh, head, thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham, and not one syllable is thine. Sail ho! cried a triumphant voice from the main masthead. Aye, well now, that's cheering, cried Ahab, suddenly erecting himself, while whole thunderclouds swept aside from his brow. That lively cry upon this deadly calm might almost convert a better man. Where away? Three points on the starboard bow, sir, and bringing down her breeze to us. Better and better, man. Would now St. Paul would come along that way, and to my breezelessness bring his breeze. O oh, nature, and O oh, soul of man, how far beyond all utterances are your linked analogies! Not the smallest atom stirs or lives on matter, but has its cunning duplicate in mind. Chapter 71 The Jeroboam Story Hand in hand, ship and breeze blew on, but the breeze came faster than the ship, and soon the Pequod began to rock. By and by, through the glass, the stranger's boats and manned mastheads proved her a whale-ship, but as she was so far to windward and shooting by, apparently making a passage to some other ground, the Pequod could not hope to reach her, so the signal was set to see what response would be made. Here be it said that like the vessels of military marines, the ships of the American whale-fleet have each a private signal, all which signals being collected in a book with the names of the respective vessels attached, and every captain provided with it. Thereby the whale-commanders are enabled to recognize each other upon the ocean, even at considerable distances and with no small facility. The Pequod's signal was at last responded to by the strangers setting her own, which proved the ship to be the Jeroboam of Nantucket. Squaring her yards, she bore down, ranged a beam under the Pequod's lee, and lowered a boat. It soon drew nigh, but as the side-ladder was being rigged by Starbuck's order to accommodate the visiting captain, the stranger in question waved his hand from the boat's stern, in token of that proceeding being entirely unnecessary. It turned out that the Jeroboam had a malignant epidemic on board, and that Mayhew, her captain, was fearful of infecting the Pequod's company. For though himself and boat's crew remained untainted, and though his ship was half a rifle shot off, and an incorruptible sea and air rolling and flowing between, 
yet conscientiously adhering to the timid quarantine of the land, he peremptorily refused to come into direct contact with the Pequod. But this did by no means prevent all communications. Preserving an interval of some few yards between itself and the ship, the Jeroboam's boat, by the occasional use of its oars, contrived to keep parallel to the Pequod, as she heavily forged through the sea, for by this time it blew very fresh, with her main topsail aback. Though, indeed, at times, by the sudden onset of a large rolling wave, the boat would be pushed some way ahead, but would be soon skilfully brought to her proper bearings again. Subject to this, and other the like interruptions now and then, a conversation was sustained between the two parties, but at intervals not without still another interruption of a very different sort. Pulling an oar in the Jeroboam's boat was a man of singular appearance, even in that wild whaling life where individual notabilities make up all totalities. He was a small, short, youngish man, sprinkled all over his face with freckles, and wearing redundant yellow hair. A long-skirted, cabalistically cut coat of a faded walnut tinge enveloped him, the overlapping sleeves of which were rolled up on his wrists. A deep, settled, fanatic delirium was in his eyes. So soon as this figure had been first descried, Stubb had exclaimed, that's he! That's he! The long-togged scaramouche the town hose company told us of. Stubb here alluded to a strange story told of the Jeroboam, and a certain man among her crew, some time previous when the Pequod spoke the town ho. According to this account, and what was subsequently learned, it seemed that the scaramouche in question had gained a wonderful ascendancy over almost everybody in the Jeroboam. His story was this. He had originally been nurtured among the crazy society of Neskuna Shakers, where he had been a great prophet, in their cracked secret meetings having several times descended from heaven by way of a trap-door, announcing the speedy opening of the seventh vial which he carried in his vest pocket, but which, instead of containing gunpowder, was supposed to be charged with laudanum. A strange apostolic whim having seized him, he had left Neskuna for Nantucket, where, with that cunning peculiar to craziness, he assumed a steady common-sense exterior, and offered himself as a green-hand candidate for the Jeroboam's whaling voyage. They engaged him, but straight away upon the ship's getting out of sight of land, his insanity broke out in a freshet. He announced himself as the archangel Gabriel, and commanded the captain to jump overboard. He published his manifesto, whereby he set himself forth as the deliverer of the isles of the sea, and vicar-general of all Oceanica. The unflinching earnestness with which he declared these things, the dark, daring play of his sleepless, excited imagination, and all the preternatural terrors of real delirium, united to invest this Gabriel in the minds of the majority of the ignorant crew with an atmosphere of sacredness. Moreover, they were afraid of him. As such a man, however, was not of much practical use in the ship, especially as he refused to work except when he pleased, the incredulous captain would fain have been rid of him, but apprised that that individual's intention was to land him in the first convenient port, the archangel forthwith opened all his seals and vials, devoting the ship and all hands to unconditional perdition, in case this intention was carried out. So strongly did he work upon his disciples among the crew, that at last in a body they went to the captain and told him, if Gabriel was sent from the ship, not a man of them would remain. He was therefore forced to relinquish his plan." nor would they permit Gabriel to be any way maltreated, say or do what he would, so that it came to pass that Gabriel had the complete freedom of the ship. The consequence of all this was that the archangel cared little or nothing for the captain and mates, and since the epidemic had broken out, he carried a higher hand than ever, declaring that the plague, as he called it, was at his sole command, nor should it be stayed but according to his good pleasure. The sailors, mostly poor devils, cringed, 
and some of them fawned before him in obedience to his instructions sometimes rendering him personal homage as to a god such things may seem incredible but however wondrous they are true nor is the history of fanatics half so striking in respect to the measureless self-deception of the fanatic himself as his measureless power of deceiving and bedeviling so many others but it is time to return to the pequod i fear not thy epidemic man said ahab from the bulwarks to captain mayhew who stood in the boat's stern come on board but now gabriel started to his feet think think of the fevers yellow and bilious beware of the horrible plague gabriel gabriel cried captain mayhew thou must either but that instant a headlong wave shot the boat far ahead and its seethings drowned all speech. "'Hast thou seen the white whale?' demanded Ahab, when the boat drifted back. "'Think, think of thy whale-boat, stoven and sunk! Beware of the horrible tale!' "'I tell thee again, Gabriel, that—' But again the boat tore ahead, as if dragged by fiends. Nothing was said for some moments, while a succession of riotous waves rolled by— which by one of those occasional caprices of the seas were tumbling not heaving it meantime the hoisted sperm whale's head jogged about very violently and gabriel was seen eyeing it with rather more apprehensiveness than his archangel nature seemed to warrant when this interlude was over captain mayhew began a dark story concerning moby dick not however without frequent interruptions from gabriel whenever his name was mentioned and the crazy sea that seemed leagued with him it seemed that the jeroboam had not long left home when upon speaking a whale-ship her people were reliably apprised of the existence of moby dick and the havoc he had made greedily sucking in this intelligence gabriel solemnly warned the captain against attacking the white whale in case the monster should be seen, in his gibbering insanity, pronouncing the white whale to be no less a being than the shaker God incarnated, the shakers receiving the Bible. But when some year or two afterward Moby Dick was fairly sighted from the mastheads, Macy, the chief mate, burned with ardor to encounter him, and the captain himself being not unwilling to let him have the opportunity, despite all the archangel's denunciations and forewarnings, Macy succeeded in persuading five men to man his boat. With them he pushed off, and, after much weary pulling, and many perilous, unsuccessful onsets, he at last succeeded in getting one iron fast. Meantime Gabriel, ascending to the main royal masthead, was tossing one arm in frantic gestures, and hurling forth prophecies of speedy doom to the sacrilegious assailants of his divinity. Now, while Macy, the mate, was standing up in his boat's bow, and with all the reckless energy of his tribe was venting his wild exclamations upon the whale, and essaying to get a fair chance for his poised lance, lo a broad white shadow rose from the sea by its quick fanning motion temporarily taking the breath out of the bodies of the oarsmen next instant the luckless mate so full of furious life was smitten bodily into the air and making a long arc in his descent fell into the sea at a distance of about fifty yards not a chip of the boat was harmed nor a hair of any oarsman's head but the mate forever sank. It is well to parenthesize here that, of the fatal accidents in the sperm whale fishery, this kind is perhaps almost as frequent as any. Sometimes nothing is injured but the man who is thus annihilated. Oftener the boat's bow is knocked off, or the thigh-board, in which the headsman stands, is torn from its place and accompanies the body. But strangest of all is the circumstance, that in more instances than one, when the body has been recovered, not a single mark of violence is discernible, the man being stark dead. The whole calamity, with the falling form of Macy, was plainly descried from the ship. Raising a piercing shriek, The vile! The vile! Gabriel called off the terror-stricken crew from the further hunting of the whale. 
This terrible event clothed the archangel with added influence, because his credulous disciples believed that he had specifically foreannounced it, instead of only making a general prophecy, which any one might have done, and so have chanced to hit one of many marks in the wide margin allowed. He became a nameless terror to the ship. Mayhew, having concluded his narration, Ahab put such questions to him that the stranger captain could not forbear inquiring whether he intended to hunt the white whale if opportunity should offer, to which Ahab answered, Aye. Straightway then, Gabriel once more started to his feet, glaring upon the old man, and vehemently exclaimed with downward pointed finger, Think! Think of the blasphemer! Dead and down there! Beware of the blasphemer's end! Ahab stolidly turned aside, then said to Mayhew, Captain, I have just bethought me of my letter-bag. There is a letter for one of thy officers, if I mistake it not. Starbuck, look over the bag. Every whale-ship takes out a goodly number of letters for various ships, whose delivery to the persons to whom they may be addressed depends upon the mere chance of encountering them in the four oceans. Thus most letters never reach their mark, and many are only received after attaining an age of two or three years or more. Soon Starbuck returned with a letter in his hand. It was sorely tumbled, damp, and covered with a dull, spotted green mould, in consequence of being kept in a dark locker of the cabin. Of such a letter Death himself might well have been the postboy. "'Canst not read it?' cried Ahab. "'Give it me, man.' "'Aye, aye. It's but a dim scrawl. What's this?' As he was studying it out, Starbuck took a long cutting-spade pole, and with his knife slightly split the end to insert the letter there, and in that way hand it to the boat, without its coming any closer to the ship. Meantime, Ahab, holding the letter, muttered, Mr. Harry, Harry is, yes, Mr. Harry, a woman's pinny hand, the man's wife, I'll wager. Aye, Mr. Harry Macy, ship Jeroboam. Why, it's Macy, and he's dead. Poor fellow, poor fellow, and from his wife, sighed Mayhew, but let me have it. Nay, keep it thyself cried Gabriel to Ahab. Thou art soon going that way. Curses throttle thee, yelled Ahab. Captain Mayhew, stand by now to receive it. And, taking the fatal missive from Starbuck's hands, he caught it in the slit of the pole, and reached it over towards the boat. But as he did so, the oarsman expectantly desisted from rowing. The boat drifted a little towards the ship's stern, so that, as if by magic, the letter suddenly ranged along with Gabriel's eager hand. He clutched it in an instant, seized the boat-knife, and, impaling the letter on it, sent it thus loaded back into the ship. It fell at Ahab's feet. Then Gabriel shrieked out to his comrades to give way with their oars, and in that manner the mutinous boat rapidly shot away from the Pequod. As, after this interlude, the seamen resumed their work upon the jacket of the whale, many strange things were hinted in reference to this wild affair.